Good afternoon and welcome to the informational meeting Tuesday, September 13th, 2022. As always, we like to start with committee reports. Could we get an audit committee report, <clears throat> Councilor Jensen? Thank you, Mr. Chair. The audit committee had a very productive meeting. Two audit reports were presented. The 340B pharmacy agreement and damage recovery billing. <clears throat> I won't get into the details since the council can expect to hear a report in the informational later uh, this month or in early October. Uh, but they each uh, generated some excellent discussion by the committee, uh, even the council members. So that was good. There were also three audit follow-up reports, Midco cash handling, the bid tax and travel expenditures. Our internal auditors found that all recommendations from the original audit reports have been implemented or are in the process of being implemented. The committee also received an excellent overview of the internal audit office, which I encourage all of you uh, council members and public to take a look at. <clears throat> And, and we can set up a time later to hear about that too, if uh, our city clerk can find some time. Lastly, we discussed the status of the current 2022 uh, audit plan. The internal audit office has a solid plan to complete a good portion of the audits by the end of this year. But as you'll see in a few months, some of those will be carried over to 2023. Uh, regarding the 2023 plan, very soon, the auditors will be sending out um, a survey as part of our annual risk assessment to identify potential audits for next year. Um, we plan to meet again October 13th, uh, where we will additionally discuss um, our audit plan, further discuss our internal controls used to conduct audits and uh, the presentation of reports. That's all I have to say today. Thank you. Let's jump to the Metro Management Council. Councilor Cole. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I attended the Metro Management Council on August 31st. And um, during that time, we got a director's report, um, which included kind of talking about some of the staffing issues that has been a major concern. And Sioux Falls is really not immune to what we're seeing nationally. There's a lot of challenges with keeping some of um, our operations um, staff. Um, so there have been 16 staff resignations with 12 hired and four conditional offers coming up. They've had 284 applications since February, and they're currently trying to recruit more. Um, fortunately, and I just want to say a big thank you to those staff members who have stepped up to work overtime. So roughly 2,500 hours of overtime um, this year. So thank you so much. And um, there's a National Emergency Number Association that set forth to um, kind of a standard on which they should be answering phone calls. And nationally, they're saying 90% of calls in the first 15 minutes here at Metro Communications is at 96%, with 95 calls within the first 20 seconds set forth by the NENA. Um, and at Metro Communications is 98%. So they're doing just an incredible job. They've been able to transfer suicide prevention calls to the 211 helpline, and that started in November 1st of 2021. And so far, 66 calls have met that requirement. Also, during this meeting, we authorized Metro Communications to give um, $215,000 from their reserve funds until the city or Minnehaha County can provide reimbursement for things such as computer monitors, various other computer parts, switches, and related components. Just with the rising costs, they want to purchase now instead of waiting until the cost goes up significantly in the next year. We also reviewed financial statements, and our next meeting will be mid-December. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that report. Move on to the Homeless Task Force. Councilor McCarris, please. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, we had our fourth uh, task force meeting last night. I think maybe potentially our most productive yet to date. Got into a lot of details about the shelter capacity in our community, upcoming challenges with winter. Um, so right now what we've got is we've got a couple of different groups working on specific elements of how to help with that. Uh, we got one group specifically working with uh, panhandling individuals on the street, how do we engage with them, and they'll be bringing something back to the task force to consider, and then 
the task force will bring that to us. And then last night we assigned out a variety of different specific things to individual members of the task force. So I feel like things are going along very well. It's a slow process, but we've got a very engaged task force. I think that's very informed on the subject, learning a lot. Uh, we didn't bring forth any things for the budget this year. I think we all recognize that that was just too hard of a push. And rather than doing something aggressive just to get it in, we want to do it right. And so I've been in communication with uh, Director Pritchett. I believe that Council will receive some sort of recommendation early, mid-November, and I would expect supplemental appropriation recommendations to be coming as well as a result of the work of the task force. But good work being done, but still a lot more meat to put on the bone over the next couple of months. Thank you. I'd recommend if any of the councilors have further questions to contact these committee members or anybody public know how to reach them. If you've got more specific questions, that'd be awesome. At this time, we have council remarks. Any other council remarks? Well, I'd just like to make one quick comment as I uh, arrived home late last night. I saw four young middle schoolers and, and high schoolers out playing catch, four of them, four different high schools, O'Gorman, Sioux Falls Christian, Roosevelt, Lincoln, playing catch out there, getting along very nicely. So sometimes we worry about the youth and uh, what we have in Sioux Falls. I guess I alleviate a lot of my concerns. So we do have a lot of good things going on in, for the city. With that, we'll move on to the Main Street Business Improvement District Growth Plan. Joe Batchelor, please. Good afternoon. Joe Batchelor, DTSF President. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Uh, I'm joined here today with, uh, by Anita Wetch, the chair of the DTSF board, Cal Raff, uh, DTSF board director, and uh, Erica Mullally, who is a member of the Main Street Business Improvement District Board. Uh, so we're going to be talking about a critical component of not just downtown's growth and progress, but the city's growth and progress, really, and that is the Business Improvement District. So we've got a lot of development going on in downtown, and I think we can all agree that our best days are ahead of us. Um, but I think if you were to peer around the corner of what comes after this once-in-a-lifetime development, I think in 10 to 15 years, we're gonna say that this was just the tip of the iceberg. With all this growth and development comes growing pains. And I think we have to ask ourselves as a community, how do we want to address those growing pains? Do we want to be proactive or do we want to be reactive? And so what I'm gonna be proposing is a proactive approach to addressing the issues and opportunities that are gonna be facing us as a community. So, let's get the right button here, there we go. So, you know, I, I think I'll, we hear it all the time. We um, heard it yesterday at Rotary, um, the golfers that come into town for Sanford International uh, say that their favorite part of Sioux Falls is coming to downtown. We think that um, this all just happens by magic, but it doesn't. It happens through investment and through stewardship. And it's really the property owners that make, help make downtown happen. They make downtown a more marketable and appealing place by investing in the business improvement district, which allows DTSF to provide these essential services that a lot of times go unseen, picking up litter, watering the flowers, emptying the trash, um, you know, engaging with, with people on the street, connecting them with shopping destinations and maybe uh, someone who may need, might need to be connected with the link. It's the property owners that can really help downtown reach its full potential by making a strategic investment in the business improvement district to best address those issues and opportunities that we'll face. I wanna take a moment here to provide a little bit of context with where we are at as a downtown. Now this isn't a reason why we need to change things, but this is just information to show you how downtown Sioux Falls stacks up compared to the downtowns of a couple of sister cities. 
We have the largest downtown geographically and we bring in the least amount of assessment revenue. Now I will note here, uh, I did not, I forgot to update uh, the amount of bid revenue this last year. It's actually about five and a half thousand dollars more than what I have up there on the screen. But still, DTSF, when you look at what we bring in from assessment revenue on a per acre basis, we're approaching half of what Rapid City brings in and about a quarter of what downtown Fargo brings in. And uh, we do it with seven full-time equivalent employees. Looking at the services that we provide, we provide all the same services, in some cases more. Uh, these are services that are carried out by people. We've tried to automate as much as we can, but you can't automate trash removal. You can't automate event planning or marketing or hospitality, watering flowers, removing the snow, removing graffiti, sweeping the sidewalks, or even telling people to walk their bicycle on the sidewalk. That's what we do with the revenue that is generated through the Business Improvement District. So what do we want to do moving forward? We launched an ambassador program uh, about uh, 15 months ago, and we've received some really positive feedback about that. Our downtown ambassador has had the opportunity to engage with over 1,000 people, um, oftentimes uh, connecting people with destinations, answering questions, uh, being an ambassador of downtown, and in some cases, doing homeless outreach. You know, um, with the Homeless Task Force, I see the ambassador program as, as being one partner in um, a comprehensive solution for addressing that issue. Um, our safety ambassadors could help alleviate calls from Metro 911, and as a result, probably saved the money, the city a lot of money by diverting calls from the police department. Uh, so it's, it's been a valued service. We've been working with consultants for the last 18 months, and between the two of them, they've worked in the downtown industry for about 70 years of combined experience. They say we need about eight to 10 ambassadors. What we wanna do, we would be asking for two more ambassadors. It doesn't get us there, but it's enough to show the value that that program can have. Um, we just want the opportunity to prove the value of that program. Uh, so that's what we have in, in this growth plan. We have a number of other services up there. Um, we're not gonna be able to take a bite of this whole apple, um, really with what we're asking for. Um, we're focused on ambassadors, maintenance, and marketing. We have a few other services up there just to show you where we'd like to go with the big growth plan. But, uh, you know, with retail recruitment, we've got a lot of great economic, uh, economic development organizations in the city. But when it comes to retail recruitment and retention, DTSF can really make a difference there. We have made a difference in the past with our retail incubator program but it was a victim of its own success. We essentially have a uh, vacancy rate that represents what the turnover is right now. We've taken it from 12 to 15% for ground floor retail and reduced that down to about 3%. So what's the next iteration of, of retail recruitment that would come uh, in a few years, hopefully, um, but we have it as part of this plan to share with everybody what the vision is for what the bid can do, what the impact could be. Enhanced maintenance is another one. We provide snow removal in key locations downtown. We'd like to be able to expand that. Uh, you know, we, we clear off the uh, crossings so people can cross streets without having to uh, jump over big windrows. Uh, we clear the snow around the parking meters as well. Um, that's a service that we heard from over 100 stakeholders through surveys, through interviews that uh, that uh, they'd like to see uh, part of uh, an enhanced maintenance program. Um, we've got gum stains that have been on the sidewalk probably for decades, you know? There's a deeper level of maintenance that we can provide that are that's typically provided in other downtowns. We would just like to get in line with what industry best practices are there. With marketing, 
we heard that uh, the stakeholders would like to see DTSF provide um, a little bit more funding and a, a little bit more of a robust service when it comes to marketing. And the thing that we heard is that in particular, they want to uh, help us demystify the parking system in downtown. And so that's something where DTSF can come alongside the city and help out. At this morning's DTSF member meeting, we heard from uh, the parking manager, Matt Nelson, um, did a great job talking about where they're at and where they're headed. Um, their, their marketing budget is zero dollars. And so we can help, we can help the city um, potentially uh, generate more revenue through the parking system by demystifying that using our marketing services. And then there's event support. Right now the bid, a lot of our events really are um, self-funded, they're funded through sponsorships, participation fees, um, beverage sales. Uh, the, bid, the bid really supports the Parade of Lights uh, and it's really just staff time on that. Everything else is supported through sponsorships. And then we have our winter event grant program as well. And with that, we launched the winter carnival uh, that the Boys and Girls Club spearheaded. Um, we pivoted last year with the winter games. We would like to breathe some more life into the winter event grant program and really get a winter uh, festival here in downtown Sioux Falls to really embrace that season and, and bring more activity to downtown. Uh, moving forward, you know, we do a lot of events, big events, we do them well, a lot of different organizations do. Uh, there are days when there's no events going on downtown. We'd like to activate downtown, enhance its vibrancy by working with local artists, um, performers, street musicians, and that's one way in which we can provide some support um, through the bid. And uh, we've got a program that we're ready to queue up called AMPT, Art, Music, Performance, and Theater. Um, but we just don't have the funding right now um, or the staff support. So uh, lastly on this list is wayfinding. That was kind of part of a larger category. We heard that um, small capital projects are something that our stakeholders would like to see. And we're not talking about reconstructing sidewalks or anything like that, just small capital projects. Wayfinding was the one that was most often mentioned um, to us from our um, uh, in the interviews and, and from the survey results. And so that's something where, you know, I think that we can help provide a leadership role. And um, with wayfinding, you know, you're able to um, put those breadcrumbs out there to keep people downtown longer, allow them to um, discover new parts of downtown that they may not otherwise um, have known about. So that's where we'd like to be able to make a difference. I think uh, if you look at the results that um, DTSF has helped um, provide the lead on in the past. Uh, I think the results speak for themselves. You know, um, I'm not gonna say that we are solely responsible for all of these results, but we definitely play a key role in it. We've seen foot traffic increase nearly 15% in the last five years. We've seen uh, a thousand more residents in downtown since 2014. We're, we're at three and a half thousand residents right now. We stand to gain another thousand and a half and that would put us at 5,000 people living in downtown, which would make downtown the 20th largest town in South Dakota if it was, were to stand on its own. We've got more people working downtown. Like I said, vacancy rates have dropped and we've seen property values increase. So with that plan, how are we gonna pay for it? Well, we have an assessment formula that has been in place for 33 years. That's a long time to go without changing an assessment formula. A lot of business improvement districts will reauthorize at least every 10 years, um, sometimes every two years. Industry standards is about every three to five. We've gone 33 years without really looking at this. It's long overdue. So what we have right now is a cap. Uh, properties, essentially, if, if you have a property that is worth a million dollars, um, that building is going to be assessed at the same amount that a five, 10, 15, $100 million building, uh, we don't have any, but um, essentially that cap is a barrier right now to our growth. And so what we're proposing is lifting that cap and uh, replacing that with a second tier that would uh, assess all the value above $1 million at 50 cents per thousand dollars. And then we have a similar, uh, similar structure with the land. Um, so, uh, 
you know, why, why am I here talking to you when it's property owners that are gonna pay for this? Well, you're, you're part of the process. Um, and we'll need to, uh, we'll come back and ask for you to entertain an ordinance lifting that ordinance, uh, lifting that cap. Um, the city is essentially a pass-through for this. This would not cost the city any extra money. Um, we're asking, we're asking the property owners to make this investment. And we've done outreach efforts uh, this summer uh, that really began with uh, a postcard mailer that went out in mid-June for a public meeting that was held on July 21st. Uh, the mayor kicked that meeting off for us, talking about the importance of downtown. We're grateful for, for him being there. Uh, we had some good attendance. I've talked to a lot of the affected property owners um, and you know we've we've gotten some good support from our property owners thus far uh, we we went to the bid board and the bid board unanimously passed a recommendation six to zero that the city council passed an ordinance lifting the cap and replacing it with this second tier um, we're talking about we're talking about about a third of the properties in downtown that would be impacted that's where we focused our outreach efforts. Uh, we've got 46 properties that are capped uh, for buildings, 83 that are capped for land. In total, it's 88 properties altogether. Um, so it's, it's, a, it's a portion of all the properties in downtown. Um, and so, um, like I said, you know, we've, we've had the outreach efforts. Um, going on this summer. Responses have been good. Um, I will just want to take a moment to recognize the members of the bid steering committee that have helped out along the way. Um, we've got some community leaders that have been instrumental with their input and guidance. And, um, you know, this is really a, a community effort that um, we're trying to make some progress on. And so um, hopefully we'll be coming back in a few weeks to talk about an ordinance changing the assessment methodology. So. With that, I will pause and open it up to discussion. Thank you for your presentation. Councilors, questions? Councilor Jensen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Joe, you were talking about um, coordinating art or doing something with art as a part of this plan. Can you just kind of elaborate that on, a, uh, on that a little? And then uh, maybe just my recommendation is, you know, come to the council meeting tonight and, you know, we're going to try and coordinate art in a specific way and work with those stakeholders to actually have a centralized, you know, downtown presence or a, or a centralized presence in the city. So can you kind of talk about how you're going to use those dollars for that as well? Because I don't want to duplicate services, although it's your members that are funding this anyway. Right. So, you know, I, I first, this is, it, it's a concept at this point. Uh, you know, I know that the city council this evening will be will be weighing in on whether or not um, the city should support a full-time um, art uh, position, um, art art coordinator. Um, my understanding is that, you know, that person will be uh, a liaison in charge of processes um, for those public-private types of uh, efforts, and then you still have the uh, Sioux Falls Arts Council that really helps um, connect the network of artists. Um, to work in tandem with the arts coordinator. And so, you know, I would see the um, AMPT program really being a, um, a program that both um, these two um, leaders in the arts community could work with DTSF on. It's, it's a, a source of funding um, framed in uh, these, these public um, presentations of art. Um, supporting local artists um, to display their um, their craft, um, their expertise in public spaces in downtown, whether that's a mural going up on a large blank wall or uh, you know an artist uh, you know playing a uh, you know an acoustic set in a in a plaza in downtown. Um, so um, we're we're uh, sort of a vehicle for them to tap into, if you will. And uh, like I said, it's. It's still in that conceptual phase, and I think that uh, you know there's there's opportunity to further define that if that opportunity should arise. Other questions? 
Councilor McCarris. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Joe, for the good work in downtown. Two questions. First, sorry if I missed this information, but the consultants recommended having eight to ten different ambassadors. The current proposal of the cap lifting would add two additional ambassadors. What are you currently at for number of ambassadors? We have one. You have one. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, secondly, how would the how would the changing of the downtown boundaries impact this plan um, or accelerate the overall growth of downtown Sioux, Fo Sioux Falls and the need for the ambassador program? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. I think that um, if the downtown boundaries were to be expanded, we would have to probably look at creating different zone districts with different levels of service based on what the needs are of those sub districts. So, you know, I think right now um, the study area goes from Grange to Cliff and 18th Street up to um, Rice or Russell. Um, but I think the area that people are most zeroed in on is that area um, east of the railroad tracks, um, East 8th Street, around Drake Springs. And, you know, you have a lot of social services in that area. And if you were to, um, I know you've talked to Chief Toom about this, you know, a lot of the police calls uh, for downtown go to that area. Um, I don't think that we're going to be able to alleviate um, uh, a majority of those police calls, but I think there are some um, areas where DTSF can come alongside and help out. Um, it really depends on what level of investment the property owners in that area are willing to make. Um, but as it sits right now with the current formula, we probably would not be able to provide much. Um, a change is needed to the cap for us mm -hmm. to really um, make any kind of impact in any new areas for downtown simply because that area doesn't have the density that a re the rest of downtown has is, has right now so thank you Councilor Bracco Joe I think the um, at least I know it's just uh, just starting with the ambassador program so far has been really great and I'd, I'd love to see that grow um, just for uh, for me and maybe some other folks maybe watching at home, can you explain a little bit more what the wayfinding, um, you know, I've, I've from time to time see people downtown, it looks like they could use some help finding their way, but I, I think you mean something more than that. So wayfinding, it, it, it um, <clears throat> starts, it, it's really to, um, like I said, provide those breadcrumbs uh, for people to um, connect with destinations. And so um, for the driver, it starts on the interstate with the interstate signage and directing people to downtown. Uh, and then once they get downtown, directing them to uh, the parking structures to park. Um, you know, once they become a pedestrian, it's having those directories on the sidewalk. We have four of them uh, up and down Phillips Avenue. And then we have uh, a number of smaller ones mounted onto uh, light posts throughout downtown. Uh, and that was really just kind of a pilot program to see if that was something that was, um, that was used and appreciated. And we've gotten pretty good feedback on that. Now, if you were to go to uh, more of a tourist destination, you might see um, you know, those, those street light poles with the directional signs that say, you know, su such and such is mm -hmm. a five minute walk or, you know, mm -hmm. 500 feet or something like that. That's probably the next level of, of where we go with, with wayfinding. And then there are some creative applications as well with um, smartphone technology. That, and that's apps. right. Yeah. yeah. Um, and even virtual reality, not virtual reality, augmented reality as well. So um, that's really next level, and that would take a much higher um, level of investment. Um, so it's, um, like I said, this change that we're asking for is really going to get us, uh, you know, some added uh, ambassadors, allow us to beef up the maintenance, marketing, and possibly the events when it comes to wayfinding and it comes to um, retail retention and recruitment, that's gonna be a few years down the line okay. when more funding comes in, more, more revenue is generated. I understand. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Other questions? Councilor Selberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Joe, for being here. Sorry I'm a little bit late today. I appreciate our visit yesterday a little bit about this. Um, what kind of money do you anticipate these increased assessments are gonna generate? So if you were to look at just the 2022 uh, property values, 
and apply this formula, it would generate about another uh, $160,000 uh, for through the uh, business improvement district. Now, when uh, Sharapa 2 and Steel District come online, that would bring in about another 115,000, but that's a really rough estimate. We don't know exactly where that property value is gonna land for those two properties. Um, and so, uh, yeah, it's, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's not exact um, right now, but we really need to get, I would say, uh, you know, that 160 really gets us to um, those two ambassadors that we really want to be able to demonstrate the impact that the bid can have. Uh, you know, when you talk to uh, industry experts, it's, you know, per person with salary, benefits, supplies, training, it's about 65 to 75,000 per person. So um, that, yeah, that, that's really kind of driving it as these ambassadors that we need to get and, and uh, yeah, so about So you anticipate 115 on for Sharapa when they come in on top of the 160? That's our, I, I call it a guesstimate. Okay, gotcha, thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions, counselors? I just got a couple quick ones. German Fest coming up. We had it. You had it? I missed it? Yeah. Again. Well, we didn't have it. The Sister City <laughs> Organization put it on. You I know what? So far behind the time. Remedy's got their Oktoberfest coming up. You can take that in. Okay. <laughs> uh, let's, I got a question about the trolley, and I keep coming back to the trolley because people like the trolley. And I think as downtown expands, more opportunities north and south, if you're at Falls Park and you have a nice time, and you want to come up to the middle of downtown and get a piece of cake, the trolley's a great avenue. Repeat for me and the council and the public on how that is funded and what the future looks like. So for the last five years, it's been funded through sponsors. Um, we've had um, some great support um, through um, sponsorships from Sanford, Marsh McLennan, and Lewis Drug, but um, that that sunsets, that's, um, that uh, sponsorship agreement um, concluded at the end of this trolley season. One of the things that we're trying to figure out, you know, these trolleys are over 20 years old. I think they're 22 years old. Um, we have a third party operator. I say we, it's really a contract between this operator and the city because the city owns the trolleys. And um, the operator is really responsible for the maintenance of these short of anything catastrophic like an engine or a transmission going out. And um, they're having a hard time keeping them on the road. And so it's kind of at the point where, um, you know, the city needs to decide if they, wanna, if they wanna buy new vehicles or not. And so it's the program, the future of it, kind of depends on, on that. Um, otherwise, you know, it's kind of trying to figure out how to take the, the current vehicles that we have and, and making them operate um, one year at a time. Just one follow-up question. Then the operational budget that you get from donations, what do you have an idea what that number is? So when you say donations and operational budget, are you referring to um, all the sponsorships that we have for our events and programs, our events? No, just for the promotions. trolleys. Just for the trolley? Just for the trolleys. So that is, um, a, this year it was, I believe, $57,000, and it provides very limited service. Um, but yeah, $57,000, um, we're able to operate the trolley about 45 hours each week. And we try to uh, operate that uh, when there's the most foot traffic downtown, which is typically you know Thursday through Sunday. Um, we do operate it on uh, Tuesday and, and Wednesday as well. But um, you know, uh, I, I think that if we were able to provide um, more reliable um, service, you know, over an expanded period of time we would probably see um, the ridership numbers also increase. So it's been a limiting factor with the trolley. Um, it's, a, it's been a little bit unpredictable as to when it's gonna come around, when it's gonna operate. We've tried to communicate that as clearly as possible, but um, you know, it, for, for, a, for it to be a transportation service, um, it needs to be reliable you know, and convenient. And um, this, we've really, um, 
we've, we've really formatted more as an experience for people, um, for tourists in particular. Okay, I appreciate that. Councilors, any other questions? Seeing none, thank you very much. Okay. I look forward to coming back and having the vote on when we change the, if we change and when we change the structure. Thank you very much. Thank you for your time. At this time, it's public input. We are up for anybody who would like to speak on the subjects we spoke on today. Seeing nobody, Councillor Jensen. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd make a motion to enter executive session for the purpose of consulting with legal counsel or reviewing communications from legal counsel about proposed or pending litigation or contractual matters pursuant to SDCL 125.2.3. Second call. And moved and second. Could we get a roll call vote, please? Council members Barranco. Yes. Cole. Yes. Jensen. Yes. McCorris. Yes. Neitzert. Yes. Selberg. Yes. Sale. Yes. Thank you. We can clear the room. I appreciate it very much. Thank you for attending. Yes.